Good morning. Welcome to our worship service. Let's all stand and let's turn to hymn number 195 as we sing the song, Since I Have Been Redeemed. On the first verse, ready, sing. I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a Christ that satisfies since I have been redeemed to do His will my highest price since I have been redeemed. Since Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you once again for waking us up to be in, uh, in this situation. Father, we do thank you. We glorify your name. We praise your name. We appreciate your love for us. We pray for our people who are watching us. The message that is coming, Father, we pray that let it touch their hearts. Let, uh, let them love you. And we pray for our pastor. Father, we pray for his full recovery, and we also pray for everyone out there who is also going into the same pain or who is also going in pain. We pray for them to recover them and bring them back to your house. In this, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Higher than 
Pleasant morning to all, and happy Lord's Day. May I ask the church to please continue to pray for our pastor as he is recovering from his operation. So let's pray for added strength. Let's pray that he would be able to take in some uh, food and drink by the mouth uh, so that it will help him uh, grow stronger and make a faster road to recovery. Every year is a target by some wackos as being the end of the world. Last year, June 9, 2019, was supposedly the end of the world as predicted by Ronald Wigand, a leader of a cult, Worldwide Church of Christ. This year also was supposed to be the end of the world according to the self-proclaimed psychic and astrologer Jim Dixon, she died, I think, in the late 1990s. But before that, making the, any declaration, before making that declaration that the world is supposed to end at 2020, she also made that de declaration that on February 4, 1962, the world is going to, en to end. Now, the world is still here. And it only shows that those predictions, among many others, are not true. Because of these false prophets, this has unsettled many professed Christians into responding wrongly to this false prediction. These people who fall into that trap were made an easy prey to religious hucksters into selling their possessions and giving it to, the, to these religious charlatans. This false prediction has made Christianity and the Lord's return as a laughing stock to the unbelievers. Christ's return should motivate us to make the greatest use of our time to glorify Him and to serve each other. This is not accomplished by date setting and making speculation of the Lord's return based on the current events. Instead, we must be ready as if the Christ is coming today. Peter wrote this section in his epistle as a corrective to the wrong response to Christ's second coming. He encourages us that because the coming of Christ is imminent, let us live for God's glory. Shall we all turn our Bibles to the book of 1 Peter and let's read chapter 4, verses, uh, verses 7 to 9. This is what the Word of God says. But the end, or the consummation, of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. And above all, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Let's continue reading up to verse 11. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister, the same to one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion be forever and ever. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer at this morning. 
Lord, we pray that um, your will and way be done in this message, that your Holy Spirit would work in the hearts and lives of everyone, that we would be ready for your coming, that we would live accordingly as if that you are coming anytime. Help us, O oh God, that we would be able to uh, order our lives according to the promise of your return so that when you come, Lord, we would, be, we would not be caught unprepared. Help us, to, help us, O God, to serve one another. Help us, O Lord, to glorify you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of my message today is Holy Living in the End Times. In the passage that we have read is actually a whole section that I have divided into two sermons. This afternoon I'm going to talk about spiritual gifts and how to use the spiritual gifts in view that the Lord is coming again. So I would like to ask you not to miss this section because this is very important that we would be able to use and to discover and to use our gifts in view that the Lord is coming again. So in this section that we have just read from in verse 7, this is telling us, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, what's unto prayer, and above all have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. So the first thing that I would like to discuss to you today is this that as believers, we must conduct our lives wisely. This is what verse 7 is saying. How do we live for God's glory in view of the Lord's imminent return? The first thing that we must do is this. We must conduct our lives wisely. And this is telling us on how we are going to conduct our lives in such a way that it is pleasing to God. In view of His return, now we are singing, Christ returneth. That is the sweetest hope that we, now, that we have now that we are in Christ. The greatest experience of salvation is when God has saved us. And then the God who saved us, the Savior who saved us is coming again. Now the return of Jesus Christ has many implications on our Christian life. First, this is the reason for our steadfastness. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 58, 57 and 58. Remember that the whole section of 1 Corinthians 15 is about the gospel, which culminated at the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But on verses 57 and 58, this is what the, what the verse is saying. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is the reason why we go on. Because the Lord is coming again. The Lord is going to change all things. He is going to make all things new, totally brand new. That even the former things in this life will never be remembered and they will pale away into significance. That's why we go on in our Christian life. And this is also the source of our comfort. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. The Word of God says, let me read from verse 13 so that we will have a go, uh, an idea of what it's talking about. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this I say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will not prevent or will not, will not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of archangels, and with a trump, or with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
Wherefore, that's my, the verse that I would like to talk to you about. Comfort ye one another with these words. This is the source of our comfort. And this is also our motivation for holy living. Shall we turn our Bibles to the book of 1 John? The book of 1 John chapter 3. Let's begin reading at verse 1. 1, 2, and 3 of chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. In the original language, and such as we are is added there. Therefore, the world knoweth at not, knoweth at not knoweth, knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The Lord is coming again, and we shall be transformed into his image. And then verse 3, this is what it says. And every man that has this hope in him, Purify it himself, even as he is pure. This is our motivation for holy living. And what else? It is also the blessed hope that gave give us the that that is the basis for our steadfastness, for our endurance when things go wrong. Just like what the situation here in First Peter, they are facing persecution. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, this is what the Word of God says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Let's begin reading in verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. That means that their, their faith produces works. The test of real faith is that it produces works, and then the and labor of love. That means that their labor, even to the point of exhaustion, is, a, is coming from their love for God. And also, the impatience or endurance or steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God, our Father. That means that their patience and their endurance is a result of the blessed hope that God, that Christ, is coming again. Now, this is our basis for our hope, steadfastness, and comfort, and motivation for holy living. But there is also a potential danger of twisting this hope for careless and irresponsible living. Even Paul has to correct some of the Thessalonians uh, because some of them use this doctrine to be idle and to be busybodies. Instead of working and being responsible for their own needs, they give up their job and become a parasite to other people. Peter cautioned the, to this Paul has to give a command that they who would not work, they must not be given food. So, they, so that they would be hungry and then be motivated to work. Peter also cautioned the Christians to be sober and self-controlled as they wait for the return of Christ. The phrase in our passage, but the end of all things, shows that the return of Jesus Christ is imminent. The end, it is not talking about time go, that time is going to stop. The, when the word end is used in the scripture, it's talking about the consummation, the fulfillment, or the apex, or the climax of the age when Jesus Christ is coming again and establish our kingdom. The end or the return of Christ is imminent. That means that it could happen any time. Christ may come any time, which is the consummation of history. It is possible to respond to this doctrine wrongly. Some have resorted to date setting and irresponsible living. The most notorious example of this, aside from the one that I used in the introduction, is Harold Camping, who has predicted that the end of the world should happen on May 21, 2011. This prompted many to give up their job, sell their properties, and give the proceeds to the organization. After his prediction failed, the ages have a field day of ridiculing Christians. Christians must not respond to sensationalism. They must have a self-controlled mind. A self-controlled mind 
exercises sound judgment that is grounded in knowledge and discernment and in biblical truth. When we have a sound mind that is based on truth, this will make us a credible and useful witness in a world that is losing its hope and losing its balance. Closely related to the idea of, of self-control is the idea of sober-mindedness. The primary meaning of this is to be free, free from any form of intoxicants that make us touch, out of touch with reality. Of course, the most common of this is wine. The Bible has many warnings about wine. That wine is a deceiver. And also other form of intoxicants. The unsaved people will usually reach for the battle when they are faced with overwhelming odds or problems. Some resort to drugs, while others indulge in some form of escapism. Among the young people, we see many activity, addict, uh, activity that are addicting as a form of escape that makes them out of touch with reality. I would like to talk about some mobile games that some young people have been indulged in. It's okay to play with these games as a form of uh, relaxation, but when this has taken you, this has controlled you, that you begin to forget your own responsibilities to your parents, your responsibility to your future, to your schooling, and of course, most especially, your responsibility to God, then you have lost your self-control. We have heard many young people who have not graduated from their school because they have been addicted to some computer games and mobile games, and sometimes even some Bible students who, has, who allowed these mobile games to take a mastery over them. You have to be sound-minded. I have seen a lot of ministers, pastors, who have fallen into the trap of drug addiction and alcoholism. Some of them are my friends, some of them were my classmates. Let us be sober-minded, let us take their lives as a warning that we will not follow that path. Because indulgement in this form of escapism has no place in Christian life. Truth, truth must be the one to control us, not any addicting substances, not any addicting activities. While we wait for the Lord's return, let us also be prayerful. We must entrust to God the things that are beyond our control. Coronavirus <laughs> has just proven that there are many things that are beyond our control. Even this tiny little thing, these this little buggers <laughs> have shown our total helplessness. So, but we as Christians have a big, bigger hope. We have someone in whom we can pray to. God one day will make all things new, wherein sorrow, pain, and hurts, and sin will be forever removed. But in between the bookends of history, from creation up to his final triumph, let us set our minds on the truth based on God's word, so that we will be sober-minded, we will be self-controlled, we, we will be prayerful. This is the way by which we are going to live wisely. Next is this, that answering to the question, how do we live for God's glory in view of the Lord's imminent return? The first thing that we have discussed is conduct your lives wisely. And now we are going to discuss the second verse in verse 8. Verse 8 says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover multitudes of sins. Continuing to verse 9, Use hospitality, hospitality one to another without grudging. The Lord's return and the establishment of his kingdom is the consummation of all things that we are all waiting for. As history progresses nearer to its climax, our enemy is throwing a desperate losing battle against Christ and his church. Remember that uh, we have discussed 
sent uh, many Sundays back that the death of Jesus Christ and his triumphal resurrection has destroyed or make ineffective or nullified Satan's power. He has no more power over the believers. Now, his doom is sure. But even if that were the case, he is fighting a desperate losing battle against Christ and his church, opposing every way that he can. Therefore, we should not wonder why the world is not friendly to us, because it is under the lap or under the control of the enemy. Remember that they have persecuted the Lord and crucified him, so they will never be in friendly terms with Christians, especially if these Christians are doing his will. But in the meantime, let us not fall into the trap of self-pity, hopelessness, and also fighting among ourselves. The only thing that could bind us together is in unity is love. The phrase, and above all things, have fervent charity or love among yourselves. This is showing us the primacy of love in all Christian virtues and all Christians, Christian relationship. Paul wrote of this extensively in 1 Corinthians 13. Shall we go there? And we are, I'm just going to read the first, the, some of the verses here. In verse 13, now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. You see, charity or love is going to last forever. But when we see Christ, there is no more need for hope because our hope has been fulfilled. We are now, our faith have already uh, come to sight, but we will love him forever and ever. And also we have, we must love each other because every believer is the, an object of God's redeeming love. So if they are love, the objects of God's love, we too also must love each other. Paul called it in Colossians chapter 3 verse 14. Shall we all turn in there? 3, 14. This is what the word of God says. And above all things, put on charity, which is the band of perfection, which is the band of perfectness. <clears throat> it, is the, it is the band of perfection, the band, the thing that unites us together. This love is not just mere sentimental, sentimentalism or based on feelings, but this is a love that is volitional. You have to make a choice to love. And this kind of love is also sacrificial, just like Christ loved us sacrificially. The expression of this love must be sincere and earnest. The word earnest or fervent in the, in the, in the passage has something to do with being put to stretch to the limit. It is just like a wire that you are testing its tensile strength that you would increase pressure and pressure upon it. And the stronger that material is, the more that, it, the more that it's not going to break. That is the kind of love that we, will, that we have won for another, that it will be able to pass the test of the tensions that we experience in life. It may be irritability, but the Bible says, have fervent love one for another. There are two tests by which we gauge the sincerity and the earnestness on the fervency of our love. First is that our willingness to forgive. The phrase, for charity shall cover multitude of sins, does not mean to ignore sinful behavior. Because if this were the case, then it's going to contradict what Peter admonished the believers toward holiness. Peter encourages believers to holiness. Then if you are going to stand it, understand it as if this is to just to ignore those sins, then he is, he is just uh, negating his goal. Rather, this means that we must be ready to forgive personal offenses. 
because Christ in God in Christ sake has already forgiven us. Shall we turn our Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 4? Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 31 and 32. This is what the word of God says. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So, it is tested. Our love is tested in our readiness to forgive personal offenses. And also, in love, we will confront others with their sins. So that they would live in holiness. But we are ready to forgive. The second test about the genuineness of our love is our willingness to receive. So here, conduct our lives wisely, love each other earnestly, and then receive one another cheerfully. This is the second test of the genuineness of our love, is the willingness to receive each other cheerfully. In Peter's time, many Christians were deprived of their homes and basic necessities because they were confiscated by, the, by their enemies, especially the hostile government. Many of them may be coming from places where the persecution was hardest. And because they were targeted for persecution, and they have to, they have to leave. Because they have no place to stay, they must depend on the hospitality of fellow believers, who, uh, fellow, fellow believers. There were no inns like that we have today during those times. In fact, there have inns during those times, but those inns are usually brothels and also places where sinful activities are going on, not a place for the believer to check in. So they, have, they will be at the mercy of their fellow believers to, to receive them. They depend on the fellow believers to, uh, to welcome them. Now it is possible to, obli to obey this command, but in not a cheerful manner. Some, it is possible that some receive them grudgingly. Because when you welcome gifts, uh, guests, it adds to your financial burden. And it will make them also target for persecution if you welcome them. Peter exhorted them to receive this displaced believer without grudging, without murmuring, with, uh, with, uh, so, but of cheerful reception. On this, Erwin Lutzer said, hospitality is a test for godliness because those who are selfish do not like strangers, especially the needy ones, to intrude upon them in their pri private lives. They prefer their own friends who share their lifestyle. Only the humble have the necessary resources to give up themselves to those who could never give up themselves in return. May I repeat, hospitality is the test for godliness. Because those who are selfish do not have, do not like strangers, especially the needy ones, to intrude upon their private lives. They prefer their own friends who share their own lifestyle. Only the humble have the necessary resources to give of themselves to those who can never give of, of themselves in return. Now, how do we apply this today? Since we do not experience persecution, and visiting pre preachers and fellow Christians could, e could have an easy access to hotels and other places uh, where they could uh, lodge in. We, this is what we, we can apply this. When missionaries come to visit our church, let us give them the best Christian welcome ever. Let us therefore love one another earnestly and receive each other cheerfully as, as God in Christ Jesus has loved and received us. Remember that we were before enemies of God. We were hostile against Him. 
But God loved us with everlasting love. That He looked at us, so our need, He sent His only begotten Son to die on our place. He took on humanity, He became like us, shared our nature while still becoming God. He lived a perfect life. He paid the penalty for our sins on the cross of Calvary. And then he, on the third day, he triumphantly rose from the grave. And then after that, he ascended into heavens. Beloved, if you are not yet saved, if you are not yet sure as to where you are going to go when you die, I urge you to acknowledge your sinfulness before God, your need before God, and then repent of your sin, and then turn to Jesus Christ in faith as the only one who can save you. The Bible promised that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can come to him and say, Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I cannot save myself. Please save me. And the Bible says that if you call on him in faith, he will save you. And for us believers who have experienced God's salvation and we are waiting for the return of Jesus Christ when he will establish his kingdom, at the time that we are waiting, let us be reminded of the truths that we found here in the scriptures to conduct our lives wisely, to love each other earnestly, and then to receive each other cheerfully. What is your attitude toward Christ's return? Is it joyous expectancy or passive indifference? We cannot be passive about the Lord's second coming and still call ourselves Christians. In fact, the Bible says that those who do not love the return of Jesus Christ are accursed, meaning lost or dumb or still unsaved. Paul said, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Anathema or lost. Maranatha means the Lord is coming again. This means in modern English, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Our Lord is coming again. Such is a serious warning to the professed believer who is careless in his own life. Who does not love the Lord Jesus Christ? Who does not love his return? To us who wait for him, let us conduct our lives wisely. Let us love earnestly. And let us receive each other cheerfully. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come to you. And we ask you, O Lord, today to speak to the hearts of those people who are not yet saved. For those who are careless with their lives, which only indicate that they might be still unsaved, especially for those who, have, who are not loving your return, who are not loving you. And Lord, for us who have received you in our hearts as Savior, help us, O oh Lord, to conduct our lives wisely, make the best use of our time, and to love each other earnestly, that we will be willing to forgive, that we will be also able to receive each other cheerfully. Help us, O oh God, that we will be that we will apply these truths in our life and in Jesus name we pray amen